Greetings, Mavuno Church. It's such a joy for me to be bringing God's Word to you. My name is Pastor Moredi Wanjao, Senior Pastor of Mavuno Church, and I just want to welcome you into this place where we worship God every week. Uh, this is Mavuno. I'm so glad you're part of this family. I want to pray for us uh, as we give our tithes and our offerings and just to say thank you so much for your generosity, for your faithfulness week by week in supporting the work of the Lord at Mavuno. Allow me to just pray. Father, thank you so much for your, 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 your graciousness to us. Thank you for your love to us as your people. Thank you that you enable us, you bless us so that we can be generous to your work. Thank you for this amazing congregation, this amazing family called Mavuno, and the way that, Lord, you continue to bless us for the sake of your work. I pray that, Lord, you, your, your blessings will be upon our home as we give our tithes and our offerings. I pray that, Lord, none of us would lack. I pray for, specifically for somebody here who would love to give, but is in a difficult financial situation, unable to. I pray that, Lord, you would unstuck us where we are stuck. And Father, I also pray that, Lord, you'd help us experience your grace. Help us to understand how to operate in the kingdom economy so that, Lord, we'll be able to walk in ease and acceleration. I speak a blessing over your people that wherever they've given, that, Lord, you'd replenish many, many times over, that, Lord, would continue to be generous towards your work. And I pray now that as we come to your word, that you'd speak to us, allow this word to just sink deep within us, uh, bringing transformation, helping us to be the people you want us to be. And so we love you, Lord, and we pray all this in Jesus' name and God's people say, Amen. Hey, I want to uh, uh, begin with a question. Allow me to start with a question. What is the most irrelevant subject you had to study in school and why? Like, like, do you remember that? Like, what is the most irrelevant? Think about it right now. Take a moment. Like, it could have been primary school. It could have been secondary school. It could have been college. But there's a subject you went through and you've never even till understood, right today, understood why you had to study it. For me, it was definitely A-level mathematics. Now, I'm sure there's some earth-shaking, important reason why it was important for young people like myself to understand signs and cosines and, and, and tangents and vector functions. Uh, and, and in fact, someone recently told me that that's, they are so important if you want to calculate the shortest route between two points. But remember, I have Google Maps on my phone, so I'm not quite sure why that's important for me. <laughs> but you know, I remember those days wondering, how would knowing such things help me to do really useful things like count change in the supermarket? Uh, you see, I had all the time imagined that maths was about numbers. And so when they asked me what X plus Y was, I thought, like, are you crazy? Like, what is this? Like, then they had things called matrices and quadratic equations. And I felt like those were just there to torture poor school children and keep us busy. Now, of course, I'm not unique. Uh, I'm just one of the millions of young Kenyans who've toiled late into the night. Uh, spending hours to cram facts that we didn't quite know how we were going to use them in real life. And for some of you, the course you were studying was actually picked by your parents. And you're told this is what you have to do because that's what's going to get you a good job. Or maybe you just endured it because you felt, you know, this is the way, only way I'm going to succeed in life. But despite all that, you still consider relevance of what you're doing that would make it useful for you later in life. Now, even though it's easy for us to kind of laugh about the irrelevant, the irrelevant subjects, seemingly irrelevant subjects that we studied in school, I sometimes wonder whether Christianity has become an irrelevant subject to many in our society. You know, more and more people are getting repelled by Christianity, are drifting away from the church, deconstructing their faith because of what they see as the irrelevance of those who call themselves Christians. And there are many in our culture who don't believe in the God of the Bible. And they have other alternatives that they see as more attractive. Uh, mention you're an atheist, mention you're a Buddhist, and people think, my goodness, you must be so deep. You must be smart. You're a thinking person. Mention you're a Christian, and some people's eyes just glaze over. And, and they think you must, they immediately figure you out, out as somebody who's gone soft in the head. Somebody who's kind of put their brain on hold somewhere. And the interesting thing is that there's so many things that are broken in our society that we know that only the Bible has answers for. I mean, corruption, immorality, injustice, tribalism, racism, just to mention a few. Our world is becoming more and more polarized and hateful. And even countries that have prided themselves as being open and free are becoming more and more polarized every year. People are struggling with economic turmoil and high cost of living, not just here, but around the world. I mean, traditional nations that were stable like Japan and Finland and UK and Ireland are declaring recessions, have declared recessions this year. But here's the thing. Do you realize that the world has no idea that the church is the place to seek answers, that the Bible is the place to seek answers? At best, the world ignores the church as harmless. 
and often even sees us as dangerously deluded people who are a danger to their society. And that's what I want us to talk about today. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 17, because there's an amazing story there. Acts 17, verse 16 to 34. And as you do so, I want to give you a bit of background about this story that takes place in a city called Athens. Athens is the capital city of Greece. And by Paul's time, it was the cultural capital of the world. Every educated Roman spoke the Greek language. And most of the New Testament was actually originally written in Greek, which shows you just how, influence, uh, how influential these Greeks were. Athens was a center of art, architecture, beauty, education, philosophy, and sports. And, and, and many intellectuals and artists, refined people, they lived in Athens. Athens is the place that defined the global culture in many ways. And Paul, the person we're studying this month, he landed in Athens after being kicked out of the previous two towns he had visited. See, Paul <laughs> made quite a few people unhappy uh, with the popularity of his message about Jesus. And so he had to flee from his life. And he landed in the great city of Athens alone because he had left all his companions in the last place he was. And so he spent some time there waiting for his buddies, Silas and Timothy, to catch up. And that's where verse 16 of chapter 17 begins. And he says this, he says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as those in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. You see, while Paul was waiting, he decided to do some sightseeing. And he noticed the many idols that the people of Athens were worshipping. It's said that there were more idols than people in Athens. Uh, and, and Athens was just this place that was just full of statues of gods everywhere. And Paul was greatly distressed. So distressed to see how ignorant these people were living, uh, worshipping false gods. And so he began to look for opportunities to introduce people to the love of Jesus and his power to change their lives. And the first thing he did, he went to the synagogue where, where people who are Jews and, and, and Greek -fearing Greek, uh, God-fearing Greeks, they would meet every week to discuss and to learn about faith. Now, these were people who Paul had a similar cultural background. And so the Bible tells us whenever he went into a city, he would always speak to first to the Jewish audiences, the people in the synagogues. And his approach was to show them from their own scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. He went where it was the easiest, the low-hanging fruit, and he always began there. And he always taught from the scripture. That's why, uh, for example, Acts 17, verse 2, earlier in the chapter, it tells us, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and arise from the dead. But in addition to speaking in the synagogue, Paul also would go out into the marketplace. And the marketplace in Athens was like the center of culture. So don't think of it as just a place to shop like toy market or city market or some place where people go to just buy goods. Uh, this was more like an entertainment hub uh, or a popular pub, a hangout joint where people went to meet people and to catch up with the latest gossip, to catch up with the latest news, what was happening, what are the, the latest ideas. And in verse 18, we continue to read, it says, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with them. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. And they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, you need to understand there are two main groups of intellectuals in Athens. The Epicureans were materialists. Materialists because, meaning that they enjoyed, they believed that enjoying this life was all there was to it that it all that mattered. And after that, it was just dying. So around Athens, I mean, the Epicureans had a big impact. You'd find sensuous nude statues uh, all over the place. There were temple prostitutes uh, who would sleep with people. Just, just, I mean, it was supposed to be a way of worship. Uh, for the Epicureans, life was to be eaten with a big spoon. And if they lived today, their motto would have been YOLO. You only live once. And these guys were like party animals. I don't know if you know any Epicureans in your life today. Uh, some of you are recognizing your friends as I speak. And now, on the other hand, were the Stoics. The Stoics were pantheists. What does that mean? They believed that God is in all of nature. Everything is God and God is everything. I know you might have heard people talk like that. And all truth is God's truth and all roots lead to God. That's what the, these, these, these Stoics believed. They believed the most important thing was to become a good person and the way to do it was to become detached from your emotions. 
Like, don't get too excited about anything. Always be cool, calm, composed. Like, be detached. How many people know some Stoics? I know you might have met some Stoics, some of those intellectual uh, Stoics around you. And verse 19 to 21 tells us that then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Aeropagus, where they say to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? Verse 20, you're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we'd like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. You see, in this sense, the people of Athens were very much like the people of Kenya. I mean, they loved to debate and, 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 and to follow and comment and discuss on the latest news. Like Kenyans are always on the latest trending news. And it's like every day there's conversations, what's trending and everybody's talking about it. So basically, day by day, Paul just went to where people were chatting. And those days it wasn't virtual, it was a real space. And he hung out with them and he listened to their conversations. And then he had a chance to share his own perspective. And he talked about, hey guys, have you heard about Jesus? Uh, there's this, I need to tell you about this amazing thing that's happening. It's a trending thing in Jerusalem. Do you know he came back to life after he was killed? And do you know he loves you and has a purpose for you? And the Epicureans, uh, Epicureans, they had him talking about spiritual things and they immediately wrote him off. They said, this one is a bubbler. You remember those Epicureans, they don't believe in spiritual things. They just believe in having fun and living for the now. And they call him a bubbler. And that word connotes a bird that just pecks indiscriminately at seeds. It's like, you're just, like he has no point. He's just talking. The Stoics, on the other hand, they thought he was trying to introduce a new god or some new gods. So they summoned him to a meeting of the city council the Aeropagus, and they wanted to evaluate these new ideas and this new teaching to see if it could add any value to them. Because for the Stoics, it was about ideas. Uh, we want to hear how good your idea is. It's like a TED talk. Come and give us your talk and let's reason together. Let's hear whether this adds value to us. And that's what continues to happen in Acts chapter 17, verse 22. It says, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 22 to 34. He continues to kind of have conversation with them. Uh, and you find that amazingly, he's able to persuade some of them. Uh, he says to them, here's what he says. He says, Paul stood up in this meeting of the Aeropagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. And he says, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, who does not live in temples made by human hands and is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made every nation on earth of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them and the exact places they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. For though he's not, for though, uh, though, he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think of the divine as being like gold or silver or stone, an image made in man's image, a design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear more, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Aeropagus, and also a woman called Damaris, and a number of others. Now, I want you to notice several things about how Paul engaged with these Athenians. The first thing is, he started where they were. You know, interestingly, even though he was distressed by their idol worship, Paul did not criticize the Athenians or act like he was more spiritual than them. In fact, he began by affirming something that he saw that was positive in their culture. He said, I see in every way you're very religious. It's like, that is awesome. You see, Paul had taken time to walk around, to understand their culture, to listen to them. He could see their brokenness, but he could also see that there was something beautiful in their culture. They had a hunger for God. And that kanga is what caused them to be so religious. In other words, they were so religious that they had so many idols. They even reached a place where they said, just in case we haven't covered all the ones that are there, let's also put up one for the unknown God. It's like, my gosh, these guys are so religious. And he says, let me show you this unknown God. It's like, I love the fact that you guys want to cover all the bases. 
but there's an unknown God. Let me show you who he really is. And Paul, on that common ground, is able to introduce them to the God who made the world and everything in it. You know, just because God is the center of the world, then you must understand that there are traces of beauty in every culture that reflects his nature. Just because of human sinfulness, however, there are also idols in every culture that reflect its brokenness. The idols and brokenness of our culture are the easiest things to see. Whether it's materialism, when you walk into Kenya and you find the blind pursuit of wealth that causes people to take shortcuts with no regards for others. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's something broken in our culture. Or whether it's negative ethnicity, the belief that your people are superior to others. Or whether it's lust and promiscuity from the belief that my happiness is the most important thing that matters. Those are the broken things. And when you enter a culture, they're the easiest to see. However, it takes patient listening and observation to notice the beautiful things that are also there in every culture. Whether, wherever you go, you need to understand that God has already gone there before you. He's, what you need to do is start looking for the traces of what he's doing and join him in it. And that's what Paul does. He says, God is already here. He's already put a hunger for God in these people and I can start by affirming them for it. He was starting with where the people were. So the first thing is he started where they are. The second thing to note is that he spoke their language. He spoke their language. And like in the synagogue, where P Paul would quote from the scriptures, here Paul did not even quote the Bible once. Instead, he introduced Jesus by quoting their own celebrities. When he says, for in him we live and move and have our being, that was, those were a famous phrase by Epimenides, who's one of the most famous philosophers of the time. And it's like he's quoting one of their guys that they'll be like, yeah, yeah, we know that guy. And then he quotes another, the words of a Stoic poet called Aratus. I mean, both these quotes were from poems about Greek gods. But Paul was not afraid to use their language and cultural forms so that his audience could connect with things they were already familiar with as he shared the good news about Jesus. You know, he was able to show that they, to the Epicureans that yes, indeed, there is a God. And the world is not a random place. You think that the world is just eat and live and die? No, no, no. There's more to life than that. Just using their own philosophers. But also, he was able to show the Stoics that true God cannot be made by humans like an idol. And as a result, we are told that people listened to him intellectually. They understood what he was saying. And even in that distinguished forum, there are members who believed in Jesus. Now, this is an amazing approach. But it's not the approach that Christians have taken always throughout the ages. For example, when Christians came to my own country, Kenya, many Kenyans who became Christians had to take on Western names to symbolize that they were now Christians. When people ask you, what's your Christian name? They probably mean your English name, right? Because somehow there's this sense that a name like Edward or, or Sheila is more spiritual than a name like Moravi or Atieno or Kimutai. Like, 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 it's just this thing where it's like, you know, it's like, in, as, as opposed to looking for those things in the culture that were beautiful. You know, Moravi, what it means? It means a shepherd. And what a beautiful thing to say, hey, there's a good shepherd. Let me show you what your name really means. Instead, it's like, just sweep your name off, take my culture. Another example, among most African ethnic groups, uh, ancestors played a huge role. And it was common when people drank wine to pour out a libation on the ground to honor or to acknowledge those who had gone before them. In fact, the Swahili word for ancestors was pepo, which really means spirit or wind. But when the missionaries felt, saw this, they felt this must be devil worship. And so whenever the Bible was translated, the word they used for the devil was pepo. So in other words, your ancestors have now become the devil. And that's how the, the God of the Africa, I mean, the, the God that was, put to the, was given to the Africans did not feel like their God. And, and you know, it's interesting because even today, there are still many, Christ, many people in our culture who feel like Christianity is an imposed Western religion, even though it has nothing to do with the West. And so this is a problem that our, these missionaries, well-meaning as they were, they had the right answer, but they were asking the wrong questions. They were not looking for those connections, the questions that were already in the culture. And we run the same risk today. One of the reasons that Christians are often caught on the wrong side of culture is that we often attack first without listening to understand. Whether it's abortion or promiscuity or homosexuality, when we encounter something we don't understand, we're quick to point fingers, but not quick to befriend, not quick to listen, not quick to seek to understand. And so we speak loudly, but we don't realize that people stop listening a while back because we have the right answer, wrong questions. 
When we started Mavuno Church, our passion was that we'd always be a church that met people where they were, understood their culture, and brought the truths of the Bible to them in a language they understood. So what it meant, it meant doing things that other Christians found scandalous, like taking popular songs in culture and saying, those are known idols, those are known pop stars you're worshipping. Let me tell you who, what they're really talking about. Let me tell you the aspiration of their hearts. Let me show you what you're really looking for that connects your, your heart so strongly to this song. And then we'll teach the words of scripture through those secular songs. And it meant that we had to understand the language and aspirations of our culture to help people meet Jesus exactly where they were. But it also help, me, meant helping our people to develop a passion to see their culture transformed by the love of Jesus. People who had the right answer but asking the right questions. And that's what I encourage our churches to do. I encourage us to find out what the people we are reaching are speaking, the language they're speaking, and to learn it so that we can have the right answer to the right questions. And you know, the thing about it is, for those of us who came to Christ in the 20th century, you know, it's understandable that what reached us is what makes us comfortable. And I'm talking to Christians now. But there's a reason why God has put us in an increasingly postmodern culture. That, and if we keep doing things the way they were done, <laughs> when we became Christians in the 80s and 90s, it will not be useful to spreading the love of God in this generation. And already, many millennials and Gen Zers from Christian families are not interested in church anymore because they find it irrelevant. They find Christianity not answering the questions of their culture. When we isolate ourselves in our churches and in our fellowships and we speak our own language just to ourselves, then what has happened? We've become too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. And yet God has called us to be the salt and light of this world, a world that is broken and a world that is in darkness, a world that needs the answer. And it's not just right answers it needs, it needs the right questions because you have to start with the right questions in order to bring the right answer. Right answer, right questions. And you know what the answer is, isn't it? As Christians, we know Christ is the answer. Jesus is the answer. And he truly is, by the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And all our human aspirations and longings are met in Jesus. There is no question our culture is asking that cannot be answered in Jesus. Jesus is the answer. He's the answer to tribalism. He's the answer to corruption. He's the answer to oppression. He's the answer to all the things, addiction, all the things that people, depression, all the things that our culture is struggling with. But it's also important to know what the questions are. Because, you know, whether it's in the office where you work or in the gym where you work out or in the lives of fellow parents at your children's school, there are people around you who beneath that tough professional exterior, they are hungry for the answers that Jesus brings. But if you don't listen carefully enough to understand the real deep felt questions, heartfelt questions in their hearts, then what will happen is the answer you have will seem irrelevant because you're imposing an answer without listening to the questions. When you listen to the questions, then you know how to give the answer. You know how the answer becomes relevant to the question. Even at home, by the way, there's that brother who the whole family has given up on and, and, and nobody talks to him because he's an alcoholic and everybody just sees him as a black sheep. But when was the last time you sat down with that person to ask him about his aspirations, about what he really desires, about where he's going, what he really desires out of life. You see, you may be coming to him with answers to questions he's not asking. But when you understand his questions, then perhaps you'll be able to show him how Jesus is the answer to the aspirations that he has. And that is what Jesus does. That's what Paul does, by the way. You know, you may know what God's word says, but you need to understand where your brother is coming from. And that's what I mean when I say right answer, right questions. Am I speaking to somebody in the house today? Yeah, that's exactly what we need to understand. The right answer, but also the right questions. Now, one of the things I love about our church, I love about this church called Mavuno, is that we are equipped and challenged to take the gospel to people all over the world around us. That's, that's something that's an aspiration. That's something we're always taught in this church. Each of us has a space where you are the best person to take the good news about Jesus. And why is that? Because you have the questions, you understand the questions that certain people are asking that nobody else can understand like you. Whether you're a lawyer or a stockbroker or a clothes seller or a homemaker or a social media influencer, there are people around you that only you are posi is positioned well to spread the gospel to. Because nobody else understands well the questions that they're asking as well as you. But you must take time to understand and find out what the real questions are. You know, there are so many great stories here of people 
who have asked the right questions uh, and are getting the right answers. I think of uh, uh, Pastor Baji <laughs> out uh, in, in Mavuno right Rende who started a dance group because that's what people in his generation are doing. They're dancing. The kids want entertainment. And in the middle of the entertainment, I mean, hundreds of, uh, of young uh, uh, teenagers come to him when he's in the middle of, that, of, of his dance sessions and he's able to share the gospel in ways that only they can understand because he understands the questions of his generation. And there are many other people in Mavuno who are doing exactly that. I think of Matrid, who started a movie uh, in her movie business. Uh, she's able to take, uh, take the gospel to people who are, uh, are film producers like her because she's able to understand the questions that they have. And she's able to see, my goodness, these are the questions that they are asking. And as a result, she's able to use her business to start churches. And it's because she's asking the right, she's giving the right answer, but to the right questions. Now, whether you're a student, whether you are a, 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 a homemaker, like I said, there are questions that only you will understand in the people around you. God is calling us to move from our comfort zones and to understand what is going around us. Take a walk in your school, in your estate, in your workplace, and be bold and fearless in engaging with your friends who don't know Jesus, not just to, not, not to be like them, but to understand where they're coming from. So that boldly and consistently you can use the language they understand to lead them towards God's light. And here's what I want to en encourage you. Every week, we'd like to encourage you as a discipleship group to invite your friends and neighbors. Uh, invite them to your group meeting. You know, sometimes that can feel so threatening because maybe they don't, they don't like Christianity. They don't like church. But you know, as you're having the conversations, they're going to ask questions. And that's a beautiful thing. If they find an open space where they can ask the questions that they need, and as you understand their questions, you're able to bring the right questions, uh, the right answers to the right questions. So I want to encourage you, open up your discipleship group. Every week, invite people to it. And here's the thing I want to encourage you, and, and even to, I'm excited to say, uh, this April is our missions month. This coming month is our missions month. And we want to encourage every discipleship group to host a Matthew party. Like invite your friends and neighbors to a hangout uh, where you eat and you have fun together and you invite them to join your group. I mean, that would be so much fun. Just, just tell them, come in every week. We, join, we, we have this time when we have a fellowship and we just enjoy ourselves and we learn, we get some content and we all get inspired to become better people. Come and join us and let's learn together. And you know, by just hosting a party where they get to see you as you really are and you can laugh together and talk about the things that people talk about, uh, you'll be amazed how people, how attractive your faith will become to your neighbors. We're also encouraging all our campuses to plan a local mission trip where they're going to share the love of Jesus in different towns and cities uh, in, in, uh, oh, oh, around the country. And so if you would like to participate in that, talk to your campus pastor if you're in a campus or let us know if there are things that you think we can do as a discipleship group where you are uh, that can reach out to our community. But I want to conclude right now and to say, hey, asking the right questions, uh, is the, uh, listening to the right questions, understanding the right questions is the most important thing you can do. And let me just say this, that this is really the reference point. Understanding, this is what Paul did. Imagine a time when people will visit your discipleship group or come to your church service and they'll be so eager to be part of your community because that's the place they're finding real answers to the genuine questions they're asking. Imagine with me a time when God's people will become the ones that the world runs to because they're like, these ones have the right answer. They're the ones who have listened to us. They understand where we're coming from and they have the answers to the issues we are facing. Now, can you see it? Can you, be, can you see yourself as part of a community like this? I believe this is what God is calling us to be. I want to pray for us, by the way. I want to pray for us because this is something that we need God's help to help us become. The Apostle Paul was able to go into a place where he knew nobody, but by listening and by understanding the questions, he was able to bring the right answer to the right questions. And my prayer for us is that every single one of us that this will become our posture. I want to just pray for us right now. Would you allow me to pray for you? Father, I want to thank you for our discipleship groups. I want to thank you for every single person who's a member of this church. I want to pray that, Lord, you would give us the grace to be bold in representing you. But Lord, I also want to pray that you'd give us the curiosity and the wisdom to be able to understand the questions that people around us are asking. Whether it's our younger brothers and sisters, whether it's our parents, people who don't know you in our, in our offices, in our estates, in our schools. Help us to be good at listening. Make us good listeners. Help us to be people who are genuinely interested in knowing people 
and understanding their aspirations. And Father, as we do that, as we understand the questions they're asking us, give us the wisdom to understand how to connect Jesus, who is the answer to those issues. And I pray that as we do so, like Paul, we would see people who are the most unlikely people coming to know you because we were willing to listen. Father, I also want to pray for our April Missions Month. And I pray that, Lord, as we prepare for it, it will be an amazing time for all of us and for all our campuses. I pray that there'll be many testimonies that would come out of it. As all of us prepare our homes, prepare our relationships, create opportunities for those who don't know you to come into our space and we'll have an amazing time together where we're able to listen and be able to understand the aspirations of our friends. As we have fun together, we're able to even find ways to bring the right answer to the right questions. And so I bless you, God's people. And I pray that the Lord will be with you, allow you to have an amazing week, a week of humility, of listening, of walking among the people around you. And may you always have the right answer to the right questions. For I pray this in Jesus' name. God's people say, Amen.